Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live Special number 196, recorded April 6th, 2014. Tim's Vermeer. Hey, everybody, welcome to a Twit Live Special. You may have seen the triangulation uh, we did with Tim Jennison. Uh, oh, gosh, Tim, that must be eight or nine months ago. Uh, Tim is uh, the founder of the new tech company, which makes our fabulous TriCaster. He's kind of a wizard in his own right, an inventor and a, a geek, and discovered, uh, he thinks, and I think I agree, the technique that uh, Dutch masters like uh, Vermeer used to create their paintings. Uh, a movie was made and is now out. When we were when you were here last, Tim, we were talking about it, called Tim's Vermeer. It's a Penn and Teller film. And uh, it is going around the country to great, to great response. Um, at all the film festivals in New York and Toronto and uh, at Telluride, people just raved about it, but now you can see it in the theaters. Tim Jennison joins us for an update. Hi, Tim. Hey, I was asking you, where the, where is Tim's Vermeer? Oh, my painting is uh, hanging over the fireplace in my bedroom now. That's awesome. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wake up in the morning and look at it and uh, think, man, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you didn't see the triangulation, you may not know what we're talking about. So can you give us an update, Tim? How, how did you, first of all, come to even be thinking about how Vermeer made his paintings? Well, uh, my, my daughter bought me a book by David Hockney. Uh, in uh, 2002, she bought it for me, and um, Hockney basically, the whole, it's called uh, Secret Knowledge, and Hockney said art made a big change in the late Renaissance and started looking a lot more realistic, and coincidentally, it was the same time optics started getting pretty good, and uh, so his, the premise of the book is that uh, 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 maybe a lot of artists were using optical tools, so I got interested in it being a uh, kind of an optics television guy, um, started reading up on it. And uh, and uh, I had seen some Vermeers in museums. And Everybody's seen The Girl with the Pearl Earring, his, probably his most famous painting. Yeah, when you see them in a museum, they just sort of pop out. Uh, you know, there's something uh, a little uh, 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 too good about them. Hyper real. They, yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, it's like photorealism, modern photorealism. Of course, cameras were still, you know, photographic cameras were still way in the future in 1650 when uh, Vermeer painted these. Uh, photography was invented in 1839. So that was a long time coming. And um, as soon as uh, cameras were invented, photographic cameras, uh, people started noticing the similarities to Vermeer's. And uh, I'm not the first. But uh, it suddenly struck me one day how he might have done this, uh, you know, using a, a very simple technique, uh, just a, a mirror, a flat mirror um, that would reflect the subject. And then you could look over the edge of the mirror and match it to your paint. And you would be tracing not only the shapes of things, but the color of things. And if it worked, you would have essentially a handmade photograph. So I tried it on my kitchen table, and it worked way too well. <laughs> um, and I go, man, I, I'm, I'm, this really works great. And, now, you're uh, not a painter, right? No, I'd never painted before. I, I mean, I took art in high school, but, uh, you know, we did pencil sketching and stuff like that. I never got into oil or acrylic painting. Um, and, uh, you know, so I started uh, searching online for anything about this concept. Uh, and um, couldn't find anything. So um, at that point, uh, I had dinner with Penn Gillette, and he, uh, I told him about the project, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, concept, and, and he, uh, he said, what are you going to do with this? And I said, well, I'll probably write a paper or uh, do a YouTube video. And he said, no, we're going to make a movie out of this. And, and it took us five years, but uh, the movie is out. <laughs> it's been out for about, uh, I don't know, 10 weeks now. It's, it didn't uh, open nationwide, as they say. It's been no, going it's a around. limited release, yeah. and it's rolling out to more cities. But uh, it is already the uh, the top-grossing documentary of the year. So we're Ooh. happy about that. 
Uh, would you be eligible for an Oscar in this year if it? Oh no, you didn't. Like, you got nominated, didn't you? Yeah, we got nominated for yeah. an Oscar. Yeah, uh, we got nominated for a BAFTA, which is no, we did. I'm sorry, we got we were on the shortlist for the uh, Oscars, and we were nominated by BAFTA, which is the British Oscars, right. uh, and uh, you know a lot of awards and stuff. Got to go to England for the awards ceremony, and the how prince fun. was there. Oh, how fun! We all had to stand up when the prince came in. So you decided to take one of Vermeer's paintings and literally duplicate it using. What you thought his technique was, you, you, you picked the music lesson. Why the music lesson? Well, the uh, concept is all about matching the lighting. And um, I felt that the best way to prove the concept would be to um, uh, make a model, a scale model, full scale, full size room. Uh, identical to the one Vermeer painted. <laughs> Wait a minute. So not only do you have to make the optical uh, stuff, you actually have to duplicate the original he was painting from. Yeah, and that's where it got kind of out of control. <laughs> uh, this, now, folks, you're looking at, if you're looking at the video, you're looking at a painting, and I defy you to tell me, is this the original by Vermeer or Tim Jennison's copy? I bet you Tim can't even tell. It's actually your copy. Oh, no, I, I see nothing but differences, Leo. You can uh, tell, okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, Vermeer's brushwork was much more refined. And, you know, the closer you get, the easier it is to see uh, the yeah. difference. But Unfortunately, the, the original is in Buckingham Palace, so we don't, most of us get a chance to, to look at it close. Right. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, you know, I had to build this room, and that took about a year. Uh, fortunately, I know how to run machine tools and, you know, rapid prototyping stuff. And uh, I did have to learn how to make uh, lenses uh, the way they made them in the 17, 1600s. Um, did you grind your own lenses? Yeah, yeah I did. Uh-huh. Uh, because, you know, I knew that if I had used a modern lens and done the project, immediately someone would say, uh, totally invalid because right. uh, they didn't have lenses like that. So... Uh, I, uh, I made a lens like they used, and it uh, wasn't a problem at all. The quality of the lens was fine. You actually even had to do things like build the harpsichord that's in yes. the music lesson. <laughs> yep, there it is. Yeah, it, it, it's a company called Rutgers, a Flemish company that made these harpsichords, and there were a lot of them. They were, uh, they were sort of like the Steinway of the time. And there are a lot of them still left in museums, but I couldn't get a hold of one. But we know exactly what Vermeer was looking at because that pattern on the front, that uh, little seahorse thing and the little squiggles, mm -hmm. up, were printed papers. So uh, those papers are still on those harpsichords, and they they are identical from instrument to instrument, basically. And so uh, I was able to make uh, an exact copy of that instrument. Uh, there's a chair in the painting uh, that they called a Spanish chair, and it has these two lion heads at the top, the finials, they're called. And those uh, chairs appear in a lot of Vermeers. And uh, so I had to make one of those, too. I found... I found uh, some examples in a, in, a, in a museum in Delft, Holland. Took a lot of pictures from different angles, made a 3D model, and manufactured the chair. The other thing I had to manufacture was the window frames at the left side of the picture. There's very characteristic uh, sort of architectural features in those windows and the, and the little stained glass panels. I did not learn how to do stained glass. So I'm not that <laughs> obsessive. And yet uh, this is kind of a fun project because you had to make furniture. You had to, you had to make, do glass. You had to do stuff that, you know, one wouldn't think. But in fact, you had to uh, grind lenses. So you yeah. made these, you made these, you, why didn't you learn stained glass? <laughs> well, uh, there's a limit, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so I, I had a laser cutter, a laser cutter engraver, and um, I just put black plexiglass, did a CAD drawing of the little lines, you know, the lead uh, strips between the panes, and uh, and cut that on a laser engraver and just glued it to another piece of plexiglass, and, and that's close enough. And you can tell looking at the painting what you're seeing, if you if you know what you're looking at, that it it's, uh, doesn't look anything like stained glass. Well, and that's an interesting me. thing. This optical technique reproduces it so exactly that you can actually yeah. look and say, well, that's actually not glass. or Exactly. Like Although when I look at the detail in the tapestries, you can see every stitch. It's remarkable. Yeah, that uh, I painted it in a very different way uh, from Vermeer. Uh, he painted it much quicker. Um, that that uh, carpet right there turned out to be, you know, uh, the the most amount of work. It took about thirty five percent of the total time of the painting, and I painted every little stitch of that thing. I see that? <laughs> and. Uh, 
it was quite painful. Uh, <laughs> At what point? Now, how long did it take to do the painting? Well, first, how long did it take to do the set? Uh, over a year. And then you've got the set. You've got you actually have to dedicate a room to yes. it, right? I had to knock a wall down to make room for a, a third window that uh, Vermeer had. And by the way, thanks to Vanity Fair, they did an article uh, on you in November, and uh, they got great images. Uh, of you and the painting and everything, so that's nice. You were working from a photograph. Uh, no, you were working from the the room. Well, I built the room from uh, um, a photograph from of the painting. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, had a little help there from Philip Stedman, who wrote a book uh, about uh, Vermeer and optics uh, ah. before my project. It was called Vermeer's Camera. So this is and, a, this isn't a completely novel uh, notion that he might have used optical. No, uh, it's, it, it's been go. It goes back a, at least a hundred years. But nobody'd uh, ever proven it by doing it. Nobody'd ever figured out a way to actually paint from that camera image, that camera obscure image. The technique you know, was lost. Yeah, everybody knew that you could project an image upside right. down and backwards on a white wall. Uh, that's a very common thing. It's called my, a camera obscura. Yeah, my mom does that. Well, first of all, you can do it with a pinhole camera. There's lots of ways to do it. But my mom has done that with her painting in the past uh, mm -hmm. uh, to take an image and to convert it into a, a painting. So painters uh, use this. Do, yeah. yeah, a lot of people do. Uh, yeah. Norman Rockwell, for example, mm -hmm. uh, said, I used the, the uh, Balopticon, which was his brand name for his uh, opaque projector. He said, I don't talk about it much, but it, it saves so much time. Um, you know, but uh, if you try to paint on a projection, you know, it seems intuitively like that should work great. And it doesn't work great at all. It, it gets in the way. And, right. it, it, you know, as soon as you start to paint, you start to obscure right. what you're trying to paint. And you change the color of the projection. And you have no idea what you've done. You have to turn the lights on. Right. Uh, so the, the addition of this extra little mirror that I call a comparator mirror lets you match those colors uh, for the first time. Uh, well, probably, you know, the first time in 300 and some years, uh, because I, I think it is likely that Vermeer knew this trick. So I'm looking at the picture in Vanity Fair of you actually uh, painting. <laughs> now, some of the what we're seeing, I think, are, are uh, Penn and Teller's cameras. Yes, uh, there were up to nine cameras running. Because <laughs> uh, they're making a documentary as exactly. you're painting. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, I had to run all those cameras. Uh, I was usually working alone. Oh, so they didn't, they didn't come. They did from time to time, but you know, <laughs> every day for three years. Would you make um, a Would you make a documentary for us, Tim? And we'll <laughs> so you'd start the cameras. How How long each day would you spend at the at the uh, painting? Uh, it would average maybe three to four hours of actual. Oh painting. man! But and I would that's, take a lot of breaks. That's why you're saying painful. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it's hard on the back because mm -hmm. you have to lean over the the mirror and look straight down, and it really, really, you know, the back muscles are the are what, what takes the heat. At any point, did you think, "What am I doing? This is nuts"? Uh, no, you know, once I got into it, it's full speed ahead. And uh, there was a time when a very bad time when it looked like the whole thing was not going to work, and my experiment was going to be a failure. Um. And it just wasn't, you know, what I pictured in my mind that would work. I thought that Vermeer could take this mirror and and work from this dim projection on the white wall. So he would have the projection and he'd have the mirror and he'd look at the projection. It's too dark and it's too fuzzy. Yeah. Especially with the 17th century lens. A modern lens would be much sharper, but that was not an option. So I discovered that I had to add one more mirror, and then everything started working. But uh, um, Teller uh, interviewed me uh, at that low point in the project when, <laughs> when it, I was going, oh, shoot, you know, this isn't going to work. And uh, he, he put me on camera. It was one of, his, um, one of the shoots that he did in San Antonio. And he said, uh, you think this is going to work? And I said, yeah, I, I, th I think uh, there's a way to do this. And, and he said... Well, you know, if it doesn't work, it's going to be a very different film. <laughs> I said, we're not going to finish it, right? He said, oh, yes, we are. <laughs> we're, we're going to make a film. You're stuck one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was motivation. You know, just, the stress level went up a couple months. We're talking to Tim Jennison, the founder of New Tech, the chairman of New Tech, uh, and, and obviously a passionate, uh, I don't uh, uh, Dilettante, uh, the guy... That's a good word. That's yes. a good word because, I mean, I don't want to say hobbyist. This is much more than that. 
but he recreated uh, a classic Vermeer, the music lesson, using optical techniques he believed Vermeer had pioneered hundreds of years ago and long ago lost. Here's a picture from the Vanity Fair article that I think is a little bit ac more accurate. Uh, w w tell us what you're looking at here, Tim. Well, you're seeing me looking down through the comparator mirror, and it's nothing but a flat mirror, a couple inches square. Uh, it could be, I've used a round mirror, various shapes, uh, but they have to be about that size. And uh, you, you can see right below my nose there, the, the mirror, and it's mounted on a strange little hockey puck thing that's got adjustment screws on the back, which allowed me to change the angle of the uh, mirror uh, very, uh, with very fine control. You don't really need that, but uh, it helped. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the, at the edge of the mirror, I can see my hand and my paintbrush and the paint. Okay. Uh, Cause I'm look over, looking over the edge of the mirror. Yeah. In the mirror, I see reflected the room out there that I'm painting and I see exactly that spot. Uh, and um, as I move my head back and forth, I can sort of A, B. Mm. Uh, I can uh, see the room, then the painting, then the room, then the painting, just by shifting my head. So if you were to watch, that's a still photo there, but if you were watching me painting, I'd be doing this, sort of davening back uh -huh. and forth. Uh -huh. And um, and so you can, with that A, B, uh, you can see any difference right away between the two. And wow. if you stop your head and just position the edge of the mirror right across the spot you're painting, there you can compare the paint color exactly. Because if you have the right color, the, the edge of the mirror basically disappears. You can't see it. It's so close in color that you can't see the edge of the mirror. So it's, it's like if it's too dark or too light, you'll see the mirror. So it's, uh, it's just like a, a kind of a binary thing. Either you have the right color of paint or you don't. Now, sometimes you quit before it's quite perfect because you know there you can you can get obsessive and you can you can refine this uh, whatever item you're painting. You can refine it forever. You can sit there for hours and hours, but you have to move on. Especially when I was painting my daughter. Um, That's your daughter sitting at the harpsichord. Yeah, she's standing there. Oh, she's standing. Um, she's the yeah. cavalier standing who's teaching the lesson. Yeah, they they stood. Um, uh, to play these instruments. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, so she's the girl in the yellow dress. Yep. yep. And uh, I used a mannequin to paint her clothes as well as the gentleman. So as you're working, this is a picture uh, from the movie that you're working on the set of... Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually building optical uh, prototypes there, uh, trying to solve my problem uh, and, and make the thing work. Wow. But uh, yeah, you can see the room in the background there. Yeah, these are, so these are mannequins. Yeah. And so, and they did this in the, in the Dutch Golden Age too. They used mannequins. Uh, life figures, and, and in fact, the word mannequin is a Dutch word um, uh, to to do clothes. But when I was painting the faces and hands, you know, they had to be there. And so I was conscious of my daughter's discomfort, you know, as I was painting. So I went very quickly. Right. And the the faces on the painting are are roughed in. You know, they're more painterly. You can see brush strokes in them because I was going so fast, uh, trying to get them off uh, you know off off the set so they could relax here's you here's a picture from the movie of you uh grinding your glass yeah the, it's wow. done on a, on a kind of a potter's wheel yeah it looks like a it. Great wheel yeah and uh in vermeer's time these would have been uh maybe windmill powered um but or powered in some other way sometimes by foot pedals and so forth or cr hand cranks but that's how they made them so the first step in making a lens is uh figuring out what the curvature is. And then you um, make a, a big brass dish with that curvature scooped out of the front of it. And it's, it's not very deep, you know, it's maybe a half inch deep in the center. Then you put that brass, um, that brass dish down on the lapidary wheel. You put some abrasive in it and you take your glass and just start grinding. Wow. And you're moving around that that you can see the wooden handle that I've attached to the back of the glass plate there. Uh, and this part of the painting, I'm actually polishing the flat side of the lens. So uh, that's just a flat surface there. The lap, the um, brass dish is not on the wheel right at this. Yeah, because you don't need curve on the flat side, right? Right. Yeah. So it saves you half the work if you make a plano convex lens, mm. uh, as opposed to a double convex lens which would be twice as much work. <laughs> this is just an amazing effort, and I, I just honor you 
for uh, your obsession. Here's your daughter po uh, uh, getting fitted for the costume. What did your family think of this as this is going on? Oh, they were totally into it. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. Oh, and good. Uh, in fact, my daughter, Natalie, who is in the background of that picture, uh, she was my girl Friday. I guess I can call her that on this uh, project. And mm -hmm. she she was there to assist me most of the most of the time uh, we were shooting. That's great. And uh, she uh, she logged all the footage, 2,400 2, hours material. Wow. She shot. She logged it all. And she also transcribed all the, anything that was spoken, which was volumes uh, over the course of several years of this project. So you could, you could uh, you know, type in search terms and, you know, find the footage that you were looking for. Holy cow. Really that's a useful thing to have. Yeah. Wow. Here's a, here's a... Uh... From the movie, a picture of a lens that didn't quite make it. Yeah, it flew off the handle and hit the floor, <laughs> and after which I flew off the handle. And yeah, the same thing. I bet you don't look happy. <laughs> no, I was not happy there. But that happened, you know. Uh, I, I, I made, uh, I think, six or eight attempts at uh, grinding uh, lenses and had to melt the glass. Um, you know, first, I'd make plaster molds for the lens. Wow. Put them in a... Uh, pottery kiln and uh, you know put the crushed glass into it and it would it would uh, melt and sink into the to the mold and then I would grind it and polish it uh, did you show David Hockney uh, your results what did he think uh, David Hockney is uh, pretty convinced uh, maybe more convinced than I am uh, that uh, Vermeer did it and um, and he you know, but he's got a dog in the hunt. You know, he brought out this book, uh, Secret Knowledge, and um, the art history world and art critics uh, uh, basically uh, reamed him for it and said, you're trying to tear down these, uh, these mythical uh, geniuses. And he wasn't trying to do that at all. Uh, and he really didn't deserve uh, the way he got treated. But, um, you know... When he when he saw the painting, he he goes, oh, it's it's got to be something like this, you know. Because you have no training. Exactly, yeah. That's part of the experiment that I thought would you know add some weight to it, you know, uh, because otherwise you just say, well, uh, Tim Jenison is obviously, you know, uh, good enough to do that, right? But, but no. <laughs> How's the I reaction think... to the movie been? Because now it's out and about, and people are seeing it all over the country. Uh, well. Um, uh, it, people really, really seem to like it. And Everybody I've talked to just raves about this movie. Uh, and I've been to several screenings at uh, film festivals, and um, and it's, it's interesting. People, uh, uh, I'm a little too close to the forest to see the trees. I, I'm not sure what this movie's about, really. <laughs> but uh, they come up to me and say, I'm in the arts. I, uh, I'm a writer. You know, I, I write novels or whatever. But, but this, this film tells my story. Right. Uh, I paint the dots on that carpet, you know, and, and right. the public doesn't realize the incredible amount of work that goes into, uh, you know, creative process. And it's a, just a grind, you know, and, and they just see the finished result and go, oh, that's neat. Uh, right. You know, what else you got? Right. And um, uh, also, um, people seem to uh, mention their projects that they, uh, they need to get back to work on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it has that effect on people. Yeah. They, uh, I think that's, somebody said that's what the movie is about. It's about your obsession, your passion for the project, not about the painting, not about Vermeer. Although yeah, you must, it, go ahead. We thought it would be about Vermeer. I mean, when yeah. we started, that's uh, that's what we thought was it was about. And um, when it came down to editing, uh, there was so much material there and so many little sidebars and different tangents that we'd taken. Um and there was, uh, you know, like I said, 2,400 hours of footage. There's me talking to the camera for at least 45 minutes every day. Wow. Um, but uh, Penn uh, went into a room with some cameras and sort of ad-libbed uh, a, a kind of a skeleton of a script, mm -hmm. uh, what the movie would be about. And he, and we, as he was ad-libbing it, it was, he was not really talking about Vermeer. He was talking about... Um, uh, yeah. about me yeah. and then teller fleshed that out and yeah. teller is a great storyteller no pun intended and he uh was able to educate the the viewer just enough to get you know this kind of arcane stuff um you know you have to know a lot of, 
of things to follow the uh, plot of this right. thing. You have to know who Vermeer was. You have to know what right. scholars have thought about Vermeer. You have to know a little bit about optics. You have to know a little about human vision and why why it's imperfect and you know why some things are really hard for us to see. Um, and uh, you have to know what a virginals is. You know, you have to know that's a type of harpsichord because we, we keep using that word in the movie. So, so uh, Teller very carefully slips all these things in it on you. And we use computer graphics to do these diagrams that um, hopefully are easy to follow. And you know, some still without with all that effort, occasionally there are people that say, "I don't get how that worked. I, what were you doing?" You know, it looks like I know what I'm doing when I'm painting because the camera is seeing it from a different angle and it's not seeing it from my eyeball. If you start from my, my eyeball, you see the edge of the mirror moving up and down and, you know, A, B, A, B, and tracing the colors. The camera off to the side just shows me my hand, you know, confidently painting these strokes. And, and so it is, you know, despite all the uh, effort Teller went to, it, it's still, uh, still uh, a tough concept to get across. The hardest thing to get across is the idea that you can't really see what you think you see. Um, and uh, we have a scientist, Colin Blakemore, try to explain the limitations that are right in the human retina. So if you're looking at a white wall like this, um, you know, you can tell that down at the bottom it's darker and at the top it's lighter. Uh, but your eye is lying to you. It's much more contrasty than that. And it has to do with this, how big it is in your field of view. So if you're standing right in the room there, you tend to see it as a solid shade of white. Um, and, and that's what ticked me off, actually, when I saw the Vermeers, that there was something going on here, because he painted those walls uh, according to the laws of physics, and the eyeball doesn't see it. But if you, if you don't believe me, there's some optical illusions. You might want to look them up online. There's one called the checker shadow illusion, and there's one called uh, the corn sweet illusion that uh, show you how the, the retina is lying to you. Um, and, and But still, you know, after the movie's been out now, that's what people don't really get, and they don't really believe it. They go, I can see just fine. I don't know about you. <laughs> well, uh, the good news is you're going to get to see this film because it's opening uh, in many, many more theaters uh, this week. Um, if you go to uh, sonyclassics.com slash Tim's Vermeer, they've got a schedule of all the theaters in uh, all over the country now that you can uh, see the movie in, in many, many cities. And everybody, it's not yet in Petaluma. The minute it does, I'm going. But everybody who's seen it just raves about uh, Tim's Vermeer. I'm glad that it's uh, getting the attention that it uh, deserves. And um, I so really, you haven't seen you haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, darn. I haven't seen it yet. Actually, I it, I think I got a well. I won't say where I got it, but I got a copy of it somewhere. But I I wanted to see it in the theater. I want to see the big. The big Don't screen. say that too loud. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's a really good website they put together uh, yes. uh, for the film. I th I'm, I'm actually quite impressed. Um, yeah, and that's all Sony. They, can, they just got great people at Sony. Yeah, yeah. Could, we couldn't have asked for a better experience. They've just been phenomenal from start to finish. Well, who did the editing? Was it Penn? No, a guy named uh, Patrick Sheffield in Los Angeles. Boy. And, uh, and Teller was doing, watching a bunch of uh, uh, demo reels from different editors. And he took this decision very seriously. Penn watched them too. And we were, when they were trying to hire a um, cinematographer and an editor. And there was one reel that he, that kind of caught Teller's eye and he went to talk to the guy, Patrick. And Teller sat down with Patrick and he said, uh, I'm doing this film or documentary about uh, this guy who thinks he figured out how Vermeer was able to get the, uh, the colors right in those paintings and get that realism. And it's, just, it's kind of a, a sort of a technological thing. And Patrick said, wait a minute, was he using a mirror at an angle? <laughs> he got it. <laughs> and Teller said, I, I either have to kill you or hire you because this is top secret, you know. But yeah, you guessed it. And, and Patrick That's jumped neat. into this and, and uh, knows you know, almost everything there is to know now about Vermeer and optics, you know, he, he jumped in just as hard as I did. You got to have a little passion. You got to have a little enthusiasm for uh, all of this. Uh, Tim's Vermeer, it's in a theater near you. Go find it. Visit sonyclassics.com slash Tim's Vermeer to find one. And uh, Tim, I'm so glad the movie's out and people are raving about it. 
and I'm glad you could come back and uh, update us a little bit. What are you working on uh, next? you have another obsessive project you're trying to? Uh... Well, I have too many hobbies, <laughs> and occasionally they get way out of control like this one did. Uh, but uh, right now, I guess uh, I'm still stuck in this obsession because I'm – I'm trying to write a book about oh, good. the whole thing good. and everything that I learned. I, I did an enormous amount of research bef before I even started and found some really interesting things uh, that weren't in the movie. And, uh, you know, there's. Uh, I'd also like to explain how the machine works exactly and how you can try it. There isn't enough information in the movie to replicate this experiment. Mm. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I can explain all the dead ends that I went down and why I did. And So the book will have... The plans you need to make it yourself. And there's also a lot more evidence I found, optical evidence in, in the Vermeer picture. Um, once I was able to get a high-res scan of the music lesson from, ah. from, the, from the Royals, um, yeah, I can put that in the computer and, and process it. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot, of, a lot of interesting stuff. You know, the book could be, uh, you know, an encyclopedia if you wanted, but, uh, you know, the challenge is... You know, kind of like the challenge Teller had, boiling uh, 2,400 hours down yeah. to 80 minutes, you know, making it accessible. Well, at least we'll have a roadmap. Have Have the Royals seen the movie? Yes. They own the painting. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, when we were trying to get into Buckingham Palace to film, uh, we were dealing with the uh, uh, gentleman uh, Desmond Shaw Taylor, who is the surveyor of the Queen's pictures. Oh my. That's his title. What a nice job. The Queen has something like 2,000 paintings in wow. her possession. And uh, so Desmond uh, is in control of that. And, um, you know, the, the subject of the movie was secret, and we couldn't really tell him about it. Uh, and, and they turned us down. They said, no, you can't come, come mm. and film. Mm. Um, but they did let us come in and look at it. But then after the painting was finished, I went back uh, and uh, to Desmond's office, and he's got like these 30-foot ceilings and the bookcases all around him in, the, in uh, St. James Palace. And um, I was trying to talk him into doing a high-res scan of the painting uh, for mm -hmm. scientific study. Mm. But suddenly I jumped off the script and started telling him about my project. Oh, good. And I don't. I didn't know what to expect because here's this kind of highbrow art right. critic, art historian guy, and uh, I was explaining to him. I said, "So then I did, I did this mirror and the camera obscura lens and blah blah blah, and then I, and I painted this picture and it looks very much like a Vermeer." And he goes, "What? You did what?" <laughs> uh, and he said, "And it turns out he's he's an optic guy. Ah, oh, perfect. And he's tried to use a camera obscura himself. He's Kindred tried to figure spirits. it out." Excellent. And he said, where's your painting? And I said, well, it's down at the hotel, uh, the Park Plaza Hotel. And he said, can I go see it? Ah, so well, I'll trade you. <laughs> if... <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so he went over and looked at it, and, he, and, and I, I had to demonstrate the oh, technique for right. him because I had a mirror there, and I did a little pencil sketch. And he, he said, uh, man, I've got some homework to do. But anyway, we, we saw him again a month ago when we were in London for the uh, BAFTA ceremony and he is a, is a big fan of the film good and we sat and talked for a couple hours about art you know he does he he was playing devil's advocate i don't i don't think he quite buys the theory but uh we had a great discussion that's great. and i offered you know next time you're in the states the colonies <laughs> uh come by texas and um and and uh see the room well, that's pretty exciting i'm so pleased i look forward to the book we'll have you back one more time when the book comes out <laughs> and I presume that you have many things to show. New Tech has many things to show at NEB this year. Yeah, absolutely. It's always exciting to see the New Tech booth. And, yep. And uh, I just I came from there, uh, and uh, I'm in uh, one of our hospitality suites right now. But, yeah, it's, uh, the booth looks great, and yeah, we got some good stuff to show. Always one of the best-looking booths, i got to say. And is, is Kiki doing the demo again? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kiki and Rex and oh, Anna. And they're so good. Whole group. Tim, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on your success. Thanks for the painting. And let me say again, thank you for the TriCaster because we couldn't do what we do without it. You're welcome. We and thanks for it. having me back. Thanks. Tim Jennison, he's the chairman of New Tech, the creators of the TriCaster, and the artist behind Tim's Vermeer. You can find the movie uh, at a theater near you.